And uh, last but not least, as um, Mark already uh, mentioned in his introduction, usually North America is much more ready and uh, prone to really use classical biocontrol as a tool. And, uh, and that's why we thought it would be good to have also a perspective from North America here. So we invited um, uh, Kim Helmer from uh, USA ARS uh, to speak to, to us today until uh, very recently. Uh, he was actually a research leader in the Beneficial Insects Introduction Research Unit there, and he's uh, very known for his research on natural enemies and biological control of invasive plant pests. And uh, as I see, he's already online. Hi, Kim, are you, are you there? Can you hear us? Yes, everything's okay. <laughs> very good. I'm ready to go. Thank you. Uh, very nice that it works so smoothly. And uh, yeah, so I introduced you already, so you can go ahead and uh, give your presentation. Thank you for joining us uh, from the US. Okay. Okay, thank you, Lucas. Uh, thanks for the uh, introduction <clears throat> and the invitation. Um, I had planned to uh, discuss things a little bit differently. Uh, the previous speakers gave plenty of case studies, so I'm not going to focus on specific case studies, but just uh, quickly provide a bit of uh, background as to how classical biocontrol is generally financed in the U.S. You know, um, as previous speakers uh, have mentioned, uh, you know, a number of the classic examples of biocontrol have come from North America and the U.S. Uh, along with Canada, you know, have, uh, are one of the, uh, the major users and practitioners of classical biocontrol over the years with some of the first examples in, in modern times. So I can, uh, I can uh, skip through some of the next couple of slides rather rapidly. I wasn't sure how much of this uh, introductory material would be given by previous speakers, but, uh, uh, but it has been. So I'll just uh, emphasize on this slide uh, that uh, U.S. practitioners agree with all of the, uh, the background rationale that have already been discussed by Mark and Lucas and the other speakers. So this is well established, the, uh, the rationale for classical biocontrol. I think I skipped, went through one of these. Let's see. Um, here, I just wanted to mention that uh, classical biocontrol, again, uh, it's not, uh, it can be regarded as a series of complicated processes. And this really explains the long timeline that is generally necessary in order to see a classical biocontrol program through to uh, to completion. And uh, Mark has again summarized these processes quite well, uh, but they apply generally to almost all classical biocontrol projects. <clears throat> um, in the US, any classical biocontrol introduction is, uh, uh, has to be authorized for eventual release by our regulatory agency, USDA APHIS. But before this happens, all of the requests, all of the petitions for field re release are first sent to NAPO, the North American Plant Protection Organization for review. So right from the start, this means that Canada and Mexico are also involved in the process of regulatory review of any release in the US. So this is a little bit like what happens in, in Europe in, in uh, concept. Now, classical biocontrol, uh, as it, again has already been discussed, is primarily uh, recognized as a, a service rather than providing a product. Uh, and, in, <clears throat> and the very basis of it, in fact, uh, classical biocontrol is an important ecosystem service. So practitioners of classical biocontrol are really taking advantage of something which is already happening in nature and applying it to specific conditions. Now, even though most Classical biocontrol projects in the U.S. are, are services and uh, are, are funded publicly. There are some private companies that will get involved in the process and take advantage of having some of these agents uh, and can make money at it. Uh, for example, there are some private companies that will recollect uh, weed biocontrol agents 
that build up in numbers in some area and make them available at cost for redistribution to by uh, landowners in other areas. Uh, <clears throat> And when it comes to monitoring releases, again, this, this uh, is something that uh, requires cost provided by public services. So overall, uh, classical biocontrol in North America and in the U.S. projects is, uh, is a service rather than, a, rather than uh, producing products. But it is uh, sometimes the agents that are produced and uh, discovered for classical biocontrol projects can be adapted for use in uh, augmentative biocontrol projects too. So uh, it's not a cut and dried one or the other issue. The advantages of classical biocontrol, again, this has been discussed already quite uh, adequately by the previous speakers. Um, I'll just mention uh, briefly at the bottom here, the last one, classical biocontrol as a as an attractive option for producers of organic and green crops. And because the, there's been tremendous growth in interest in organic and or green crops around the world, the, uh, it needs to be mentioned that uh, there are fewer management options that these green growers have and therefore classical biocontrol and augment biocontrol agents are especially attractive options for these growers. Now, there, <clears throat> the U.S., obviously, with a, a very, very wide range of projects, uh, there are many, many different participants uh, with many different motivations. Uh, Norm Lepla and uh, cooperators uh, recently surveyed U.S. biocontrol producers, and they identified in their survey 340 different research and extension persons who identified themselves as being involved either full-time or part of their time in biocontrol programs. But not all of these researchers were employed in classical biocontrol. Um, roughly one-third of them identified themselves as being working primarily in classical biocontrol, and two-thirds of them uh, generally more applied toward uh, con conservation biocontrol. Of all of these, uh, the majority, about two thirds of scientists in biocontrol are employed by universities and the, uh, the remaining third employed by federal agencies and state agricultural agencies. So then the number of personnel involved in classical biocontrol in across the US roughly is only involves about a hundred people and not all of them working full time in classical biocontrol. These are spread among a variety of agencies. The uh, USDA has two agencies that are primarily involved in biocontrol, uh, Agricultural Research Service and uh, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. And uh, as you might expect, uh, US Department of Agriculture is primarily interested in pests and weeds that uh, impact agricultural crops, but they're also interested in pests of landscape because many agricultural crops obviously are also landscape pests like brown marmorated stink bug, uh, spotted lanternfly coming onto the, the horizon now. Uh, USDA and APHIS also become interested in uh, management of forestry pests along with the uh, U.S. Forest Service. Uh, and USDA is also interested in uh, landscape and aquatic weeds. So basically USDA is... Uh, gets involved in biocontrol of, of almost all invasive insect pests and weeds. Bureau of Land Management is another federal agency. Bureau of Land Management manages uh, a vast area of lands, mostly in the western U.S., and most of these lands are used for grazing, so weed biocontrol is an important uh, interest of theirs, and they've been involved in funding biocontrol projects of uh, against invasive weeds for many years. Uh, I mentioned the Forest Service, particularly interested in uh, insects that uh, impact forests across the U.S. State Departments of Agriculture, uh, some of the big states that uh, for which agriculture is very important, like California, Texas, and Florida, uh, 
have people working on biocontrol. Um, water management agencies across the U.S. are particularly interested, obviously, in aquatic weeds and uh, various agencies, uh, especially in states like Florida with lots of water, uh, have been very active in funding and uh, being involved in distributing and in surveying and monitoring biocontrol programs along with uh, cooperators and other agencies. Commodity groups do get involved. Uh, most of the funding in North America does come from public agencies, but commodity groups do sometimes contribute funding. Uh, and examples of, uh, of these include uh, the berry producers, for example, with the, the recent introduction of spotted wing drosophila. Um, <clears throat> and then parks and environmental organizations also are uh, involved in biocontrol, and they're particularly interested in invasive insects and weeds that impact negatively native species diversity. So you can see that there's a very broad range of actors with uh, various motivations. Uh, anyone who may be interested in this survey of practitioners, uh, there's a link shown on this slide, and I don't know if these slides will be made available by the by the organizers, but if not, if anyone wants to uh, to get a hold of this, they can contact me if, if interested. So the resources available, again, uh, uh, a topic which has uh, already been touched on by uh, the other speakers for all the different case studies. Uh, obviously, the human resources are, are critical right from the start in order to mount a project for biocontrol, specialized knowledge by uh, entomologists and weed scientists, botanists uh, is, is critical right from the start. Uh, and as I mentioned in North America, there's a limited pool of, of people working in this area. So there's limited number of permanent staff. And this means that uh, many biocontrol control programs rely on grant funding for particular projects to hire supplementary personnel to uh, assist in specific projects. And this usually includes, uh, uh, could be temporary term scientists hired on grant funds for limited terms, uh, but it also includes contributed personnel from uh, graduate students working in universities who are doing research as part of their thesis on projects that are part of the biocontrol program. Um, classical biocontrol also requires specific containment laboratories uh, needed in order to conduct the pre-release research, and not all institutions have these quarantine containment labs, so much this limits the, uh, the host specificity research that must be done to particular locations. And these quarantine containment labs obviously are, they require specialized construction and uh, availability of uh, uh, expensive environmental chambers and so on. So this is a critical resource. The ability to travel in a native range of the pest and or the weed is also uh, could be considered a resource. Uh, some countries where we would like to go are, are now difficult to, to go. Uh, historically, many of the, the uh, pests introduced into California, for example, came from the Middle East, uh, many of them from Iran. And it's uh, in more recent years, um, Iran and, and other countries like this are, are difficult to access and uh, U.S. federal agencies are not allowed to work in some countries for political reasons. And we must rely on uh, other cooperators, uh, paid cooperators sometimes to to uh, to work with cooperators in other countries sometimes will help to give access to areas that are restricted to U.S. practitioners. And then, of course, uh, the regulatory aspect of classical biocontrol. Uh, this could be considered a, a resource also. The regulatory permits, uh, both for export from of agents from the native range where they're collected, and for import into the U.S. 
of candidate biocontrol agents. Uh, this is all part of the process uh, and all uh, requires resources in order to obtain all of these. Kim, just to let you know, uh, about two minutes. Okay. The providers of resources for classical biocontrol programs. Uh, again, I'm mostly uh, federal agencies, USDA granting programs, and APHIS with uh, their annual base funding, uh, national farm bill projects, fund specific programs. Uh, APHIS gives block grants to different states that the states can then use to apportion to programs of particular interest in their area. Uh, competitive grant programs provide uh, funding. Other federal and state agencies provide specific funding for projects. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, certain commodity boards uh, end user stakeholder groups like uh, Driscoll's Berries in California, California Olive Committee, soybean boards. Uh, have funded biocontrol research in past years. Uh, and then graduate students uh, visiting and sabbatical scientists and so on. Uh, these all provide uh, resources that are used to fund these programs. In the US, uh, a recent publication by Van Driesch and uh, his co-authors uh, list and summarize some of the more recent programs in the US in uh, over past decades uh, in all of these areas, agricultural pests, urban pests, grazing lands, forest pests. Uh, and I mistakenly have the wrong date here, 2008. This, was, uh, this came out in 2022. But this is a good summary of recent work in the US in classical biocontrol in uh, recent times. And they, in this publication, they examine biocontrol programs you know, specifically in the US and comparable to some of the studies that are alluded to by the other speakers. Roughly half of the classical biocontrol programs uh, provide significant amounts of benefit uh, to whatever target uh, project of interest. Uh, and I think it's important to mention at this point that uh, Classical biocontrol does not need to be completely successful to be an important contributor to integrated pest management because cl uh, classical biocontrol oftentimes is only one of a number of different management tools that's available and any significant amount of, of uh, gain that it can contribute is an important contributor to IPM and to the end users. So it doesn't have to be the, the sole solution. There are many collateral benefits to classical bowel control programs. Um, I won't go through all these in detail because time is limited, but obviously the research that's uh, produced as a result of a classical bowel control program builds future success in other projects. It adds uh, training to uh, people in many, many different agencies and countries. It contributes information to existing databases on genetic resources, helps to uh, provide training and data on conservation and sustainable use in biological diversity, and contributes to local economies uh, who are attempting to introduce new crops. For example, uh, hazelnuts in the Republic of Georgia and olives in, uh, the, in uh, the Middle East and Palestine, for example. Developmental risks have been uh, already well discussed by previous speakers. Um, and again, here I'll just point out in particular, uh, one risk is the environmental consequence of not having biocontrol as a management option. Because many of the other management options introduce uh, a wide range of risks of their own. And by using classical biocontrol, we can reduce risks of uh, negative risks of uh, a wide range of other, other uh, management tools. And to help reduce these risks, close collaboration with a wide range of other scientists, including taxonomists, is, is very important. Uh, chemical ecology is very important at helping to uh, assess the, the suitability of a biocontrol agent. Um, 
these projects typically all require close collaboration, not only between other types of scientific fields, but also the regulatory permitting agencies, uh, agencies that provide the chipping services, it, uh, agencies that offer mass rearing opportunities, and the end users themselves, uh, the growers and those who help uh, becoming involved in field release and evaluation. And uh, again, I wanted to just mention the Nagoya Protocol, which uh, I think Vincent mentioned. Uh, the Nagoya Protocol offers opportunities for countries to recognize that biocontrol is uh, an important contributive uh, feature for recognizing and uh, sustaining and using their genetic resources and using these benefits, but also that they need to facilitate the research that's important in biological control. And uh, this is still a, a very early process for many countries. And this is one of the risks. Biocontrol is uh, uh, under, bi under Nagoya protocol. Many practitioners are concerned that uh, this will end up limiting the access to potential biocontrol agents in different countries. Uh, in order to help moderate this risk, IOBC, the International Organization for Biocontrol, has taken a very active role in uh, in helping to promote the use of biocontrol and make uh, intergovernmental organizations aware of the importance of the use and exchange of biocontrol agents. They they send observers to meetings. They write opinions that have been published in scientific journals. Uh, commercial biocontrol producer groups have gotten involved, and they send in observers. Uh, the U.S. federal agents agencies also. Uh, send observers, and they're interested in this process. Um, can so, in summary, I think end? I can say that uh, I think I can say that the U.S. has been a leading player, uh, and it will continue to be a leading player because we can expect a continual introduction of invasive pests. And the U.S. I think is committed to uh, continuing to rely on classical biocontrol where it uh, has a role in the future. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Kim. If there's a burning question, we can take this question now. Yes, Mark has a question. It's not really burning, but I think it's, it's important. Thanks, Kim. It's Mark Ennis here for this inspiring talk we, that will be useful in the discussion. I was wondering whether you felt in the last uh, decades since you worked a positive or a negative uh, a perception of classical biocontrol in the public in the US. Yes, the, uh, I, I think several of the speakers have alluded to this in their talks also. Um, whenever biocontrol, whenever classical biocontrol and in introducing a new agent is mentioned, there are, are very often people who step up and say, well, what about cane toads or what about this or what about that? What about uh, uh, native thistles? Uh, these questions do continually come up and it's a very important for the biocontrol community to continually re-educate uh, the public at every opportunity that classical biocontrol agents uh, are, are not introduced now unless they're very, very specific. Um, many of the examples that have been brought up of, of poor practice in the past would never occur now under current standards. Uh, and I think in general, the perception that classical biocontrol is, uh, is potentially dangerous for, for uh, environmental reasons is a misperception that needs to be, needs to be explained over and over again. Um, so this is, this is occasionally a problem, and uh, when we do interviews, uh, this is something that often comes up, and we spend part of our time explaining that the agents we, we introduce are rigorously tested in quarantine lab before we receive permission to release them. Uh, but I think in general, the, uh, the public is very interested in the idea of biocontrol for, as, a, as a sustainable 
management for invasive tests. And I, I think overall the, uh, the public is accepting, but uh, there is this continual need to, uh, to explain the, you know, that it's being done very safely and um, the examples that uh, have happened in the past are very unlikely to uh, happen again, the, the bad examples. Thank you very much. And that concludes this session. I give over to Thibaut.